Keto and crime, keto and crime. We uncover the crime on keto and crime. Keto and crime, keto and crime. Now is the time for keto and crime. Hey everyone, Tracy here from Keto and Crime. Thank you so much to every single one of my patrons and channel members. You make this possible. And, uh, you're one of the reasons I do this, and I thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And if I haven't said it before, thank you. I'll sing it. Thank you. Thank you for hanging in there with me and letting me geek out, not making fun of me like a lot of other people do, because I like weird stuff about crime and dark history. Re, re. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Hey everyone, welcome back to Keto and Crime. Welcome to our study of the Christian Emperor, Constantine the First, also known as Constantine the Great. He was the Roman Emperor that attempted to reunite the Eastern and Western Roman Empires and unite them under the banner of Christianity as the state religion of Rome. So that's very big in the history of the Christian Church as well as Catholic Church, since again, they claim all that. So that's what we're about to dive into, and I hope you enjoy these images of historical figures and artwork. I, I thought it might be a nice change of pace. And so with that being said, well, let's dive into Constantine the Great. To really understand Constantine, we have to understand the time he was born into. Having been born around Common Era, or A.D. 272, he was born at what most scholars would pinpoint as the start of the fall of the Roman Empire. So his reign came, of course, later, but he was in that tumultuous period where the foundation was cracking just a little bit. Now, in our previous study of, Ro of Rome and uh, specifically the Emperor Nero, as you recall, Nero was the last of the Julian Claudian or Julian Augustan emperors, that is the first five emperors of Rome that all claimed in their line of in their line of secession, in their line of relation, Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar, the first emperor of Rome. So Nero, once he died in 69 CE or 69, AD, it ended that dynasty. And the entire year of 69 AD or CE, you had four different emperors, uh, politicians and generals seizing the throne and trying to establish a dynasty. And it was only the final emperor to rule during that tumultuous year of four emperors, known as Vespasian, who was a general in the Roman army and well loved by the people did seize control and maintained it for a 10 year reign. Not only that, he established yet another dynasty known as the Flavian dynasty that would rule Rome for the next 27 years. And that in itself is where during that during the Flavian dynasty, that is where Rome grew to its apex. And so those years are long gone. We're talking, you know, over 100, 150 years later. And now what has happened is Rome had gotten so prosperous, they had extended further to the west into what would eventually be Germany, Britain, and Spain. That is Britain, uh, or Britannia, Gaul, and Hispania, which would eventually be the Western European countries of Spain. Germany and Great Britain, and they had also expanded further east into what would eventually become the middle, modern day Middle East, or for our timeline, the birthplace of the uh, Byzantine Empire followed by the Ottoman Empire. So you see how they were kind of expanding, and they had expanded so much that they could no longer, under the one emperor, model, the one emperor ruling from Rome could control their empire because it took days. This is not, you know, they don't have the technology we have where you can send a message in seconds. This is takes 
messengers riding or running over thousands of miles to deliver a message and it could take sometimes two weeks to get a message from Rome to the governors and military commanders either further east or west. So what had happened is that a Roman emperor by the name of Diocletian who in 293, this was kind of third of the way into Constantine I's um, political career, decided that he would divide the empire into what is known as a tetrarchy, which is basically in the east. He had two high emperors, that is the ones that he called the Augustans, after the first emperor of the Roman Empire, Augustus Caesar, they were the high emperors, and then underneath them, they could appoint, or he would appoint, two junior emperors to help kind of be, you know, more like regional governors or regional emperors called Caesars. So you had, in the east, two high emperors called Augustans, and in the west, you had two high emperors known as Augustans. And then you had two junior emperors underneath, one under each one of those known as the Caesar, which helped kind of co-rule both east and west. And so you essentially had the Roman Empire at that point split between the western half and the eastern half, west ruled by four emperors and the east ruled by four emperors, though they had varying ranks. And so that's the kind of world that Constantine was moving in and ruling in. It was very much on the way to the collapse of the Roman Empire as we know it. But who was Constantine? Well, he was born in the city of Nassus, which is cur currently modern-day Serbia. Uh, he has was the son of Flavius Constantinus, who was a very well-known general and regional governor uh, that served Diocletian well, though Diocletian was always kind of afraid of him. We'll, we'll get to that. And a low-ranking uh, Greek woman by the name of Helena. Now, it is not known whether she was legally married to Constantinus or was just his concubine, but that was his mom. Now, he was very close to his mom most of his life, and she's actually the one that first mentioned the Christian religion to him, though not in depth. So she, as a Greek, had studied a lot of things and knew about Christianity and actually explained it to them. So basically, Constantine grew up under the tutelage of his father until he was pretty much uh, knew where his station in life would be, but that did not stop the emperor, the high emperor, or the Augustan emperor, uh, Diocletian, who remember I just said, was a little bit afraid of Constantine's father. And so what he did to kind of keep Constantine's father in check, he offered to kind of semi-adopt Constantine and bring him to his court, which his court was in the east in modern-day um, Turkey, and have him tutored and raised as kind of an adopted family member. Remember, uh, Romans still love to adopt people uh, to make sure they have the right uh, heir to the throne. But the other uh, method or to, the, to that madness was that he would kind of hold Constantine as a elevated hostage to keep his father in check. So... Um, that happened. He was raised in uh, Turkey under in Diocletian's court, was actually tutored by a famous Christian philosopher of the day or a philosopher that happened to be Christian, and basically uh, was raised as the emperor's son. Now he, the high emperor's son. Now he did a uh, kind of move through the ranks of the Praetorian Guard and established himself as very capable, and Diocletian liked him really did. And a lot of people suspected that Diocletian would name him as his heir. Constantine returned to uh, Diocletian's court after a long campaign in the, in the West and returned there about 303 AD or a common era. And that is where we have the great persecution of the Christians. Now they've been persecuted all along, all the way back with Nero and even Caligula. But this is where the uh, empire kind of made it their 
goal to stamp out this new sect of Judaism or this new cult. And they did it, not only did they ramp up executions and Colosseum games, they also took away church property and other such things and really, really persecuted them. Now, Constantine didn't really do anything about it. He did speak out against it a time or two, but was quickly silenced. But uh, it's well proven that he did not have any part in the persecutions, though he couldn't really stop it. And that is a huge criticism of him by later Christian or Catholic scholars. By 305 AD or a CE, Diocletian, remember, one of the high emperors of the East, got very, very sick and basically had to resign his, his office as high emperor. And basically most people figured he would have, at least promote Constantine to a junior emperor, like one of the Caesars, if he promoted, you know, somebody up. Everybody was just expecting that, but that didn't happen. There was another man by the name of Galerius who was a well-known general and a prefect, you know, regional prefect underneath this whole combuttled four-emperor system, and basically he manipulated Diocletian into appointing him to the rank of Augusta or High Emperor. So basically, this new this new dude, Galerius, just basically manipulated the very sick Diocletian into promoting him to higher emperors. And also, along with his two nephews, Severus and Maximinus were appointed Caesars or Junior Emperors. So basically, Constantine and another adopted a uh, nephew of Diocletian, Maximinus, were, uh, were totally ignored. And, of course, what did the new high emperor, uh, Galerius, do? He immediately sent Constantine back out on a military campaign. 305, Constantine's father, Constantinus, who was still very high-ranking governor and a uh, military commander in the West, sent for his son, Constantine, because he feared that the new emperor would execute him. So eventually, um, Galerius did allow it, though, from what I understand, Constantine had to flee the court at one point while, you know, allies worked on the old emperor to kind of allow it. But, you know, a lot of this can just be construed as legend as well. But let's just say that Constantine did end up in Gaul, which is modern day Germany, with his father in summer of 305 Common Era or AD. Constantine did help his father put down several revolts in uh, Hispania, Gaul, and Britain, but eventually um, his father did pass away as a result of the fighting, and all of the his father's former territories did kind of support Constantine to be raised to the rank of High Emperor in the West, but as you can imagine, Galerius, the high emperor in the east, who is actually in charge of such things, wasn't exactly in favor of that. And upon the death of another high emperor, um, Constantine basically threatened Galerius, saying that he would rebel if he was not promoted. And eventually Galerius compromised with him and promoted him to... Uh, Caesar or low emperor in the West, kind of, you know, either do this or I'm going to fight you. Uh, so basically, Constantine became Caesar or low emperor of Britain, Gaul, and Hispania. And he commanded what was at that time the largest Roman army in the empire. So he was, you know, pretty well to be feared, in my opinion. And then from there, he started... Uh, marching further west, conquering a few more of the territories. Now, everything beyond Gaul and Hispania was kind of uncharted territory. A lot of barbarians, quote-unquote, and so he did go out and conquer several more of these, kind of expanding the empire to the west. Now, one thing about this multi-emperor system, no one trusted anybody. I think you probably already picked up on that. But uh, another uh, emperor in the West, Maximum, decided that he wanted to have the whole empire. And so he started a revolt. And Constantine, of course, having the largest army, was the main one to fight him. And eventually he did defeat him. And upon defeating him, realized, well, maybe I, Constantine, ought to be the high emperor of the whole 
shebang. And so this is where we enter into a series of many civil wars, if you will, for control of the Roman Empire. You can see why this is the beginning of the end. So basically, you've got Constantine fighting a couple other lower emperors, as well as Galerius, the high emperor, and just a whole lot of fighting. But Constantine was doing quite well. He was pushing further east, for pushing further west. And basically, everyone feared Constantine. And he was quite a, you know, force to be reckoned with. In 312, Constantine conquered Maximentus, the... Uh, Augusti, or High Emperor of Rome, and pushed into Rome, uh, therefore kind of sealing his popularity with the common people. But this wasn't the end of the Civil War. Still regional governors, lower emperors, higher emperors, all fighting each other. Eventually, in 313, he met another of the emperors in Rome, and they established kind of a treaty to kind of co-rule the West together. And basically, they came up with what is known as the Edict of Milan, in which Christianity could be, could be practiced openly. Now, one of the major reasons that a lot of Romans didn't like Christianity is because it limited their ability to add conquered people's gods to their own pantheon. Like, it was real easy to take a conquered people's god and put it into the existing Olympians as a junior or a senior god. And that way you had commonality with the people you just conquered. Well, Christianity didn't allow any of that. And that was one of the major reasons that a lot of people didn't like it. But they did at that point uh, say that it was all right to be practiced. Now, this is after the legend where at a battle, Constantine gave credit to Jesus for his victory and painted the first two letters of Christ's name in Greek on his shields at a stand at the bridge. That has not been proven as actually happening, though the battle at the bridge did happen, and it was how we got here to, to the treaty with uh, Licinius. So, yeah. But let's just say Licinius went back on his word and was openly persecuting the Christians again by 320. And as a result, a, another civil war occurred. And this was the great civil war of 324 between Licinius and Con uh, Constantine and Constantine I. And it was during this rebellion that uh, the other emperors of the East were also defeated and Constantine became the one and only em emperor. And he then moved the uh, capital of Rome to what is today uh, Constantinople, Turkey. And it was from here that Constantine eventually made Christianity the state religion and basically continued to try to expand the empire. This is, you know, when we had the Council of Nicaea where certain questions were kind of formalized that you started seeing what became the Catholic Church take its take its shape. Instead of just all these different Christian prophets out there speaking roughly the same thing but different, you now had a foundation because of the Council of Nicaea for those beliefs. And so basically you had a lot of question settled. You had a lot of things from pagan religions encompassed into religion, into Christianity during this time, i.e. a lot of the festivals and holiday. He also established uh, Sunday should be a day of rest for all, all people. And basically, he loved to persecute Jewish people, unfortunately. He did pass a number of administrative reforms that were not good for the Jewish people. Uh, they were not allowed to own slaves. They had to, uh, they could not convert anybody to the Jewish religion. Uh, but he did allow their clergy the same exemptions as Christian clergy um, and did not allow taxation or anything like that. So you see a lot of things that Constantine set in motion that still with us today when it comes to Christianity or religion in general. Constantine died on 22nd May, uh, 337 CE or AD, was succeeded by his son, Constantine II, and is bar was buried uh, near Constantinople. Now, he died in a campaign to further 
conquered the east. They were moving on further east uh, from Turkey. So this is where he first encountered uh, the people that would eventually make up the Persians and eventually the Ottoman Empire, which would be uh, the main purveyor of the Islamic side during the Crusades. So as you can see, it's all shaping up for the inevitable fall of the Roman Empire as we know it, and then the collapse of history into the Dark Ages, or Middle Ages, however you wish to term it. But this is the story of Constantine.